Welcome to Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone in the Libertarian Institute. Today, I am joined by the author of The Most Dangerous Superstition to discuss his new movie, Jones Plantation. Larkin, where is the best place for people to find the movie? JonesPlantationFilm.com is where you can get it online and you can get a version with director's commentary and all sorts of stuff there. Connor Freeman of the Libertarian Institute went to see this and we had an absolute blast. I don't want to give anything away. But the best part was the political ads. I'm not going to give away anything else. We had an absolute blast. The crowd loved it. There was even a woman in the audience who uh, raised her hand at the end for, uh, during the Q&A and said, you know, I wasn't even supposed to be here. Uh, there was a babysitting mix up, but uh, I ended up loving the movie and I can't wait to recommend it. Do you remember that happening in Phoenix? Yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. And that's mostly what I like to hear is how does this register for normal people who aren't already into this stuff when it comes to uh communicating the message of freedom what in your experience works best logic empirical evidence historical narrative socratic questioning or storytelling to me there are two steps that are fundamentally different like psychologically the first is getting something that's going to nudge somebody into daring to question stuff and it may be a short little video like i've had people say that the tiny dot did that or the original version of the jones plantation did that the little animated thing just something that sort of sticks that grain of annoyance in their brain and makes them go yeah what about that that first step to me is always the most important so i'd give two completely different answers whether you're asking what do you find makes that first grain happen as opposed to as soon as somebody's interested, what makes them actually think about it? Cause then I would like give them my book, the most dangerous superstition or point them to a hundred different videos by, you know, not just me, but a, a bunch of people. But that first step to me is always the most important and it's different for different people. I find some people like I made a video called I'm allowed to rob you ages ago. And a lot of people said, yeah, that's that silly little thing started me on my journey. So to me, what I most want to focus on, especially like with this movie, is just the thing that nudges them into going something's like fundamentally not right. And once their brain starts looking at it, then they they take themselves on the journey you can't take them on the journey <laughs> for them if they don't want to go and that's why i think the focus really needs to be for the general public you know doing that first little thing that makes them go hmm i'm gonna have to think about that because that's that after that they do it themselves and you can you know give them all sorts of resources and stuff but really that first nudge but it's kind of unpredictable what's going to do it i've had different people reference different videos or different Sometimes just silly little comments somewhere will start them thinking. So it's different for different people, which is why I'm all I'm always trying to find different ways. But I think for a whole lot of people, the Jones Plantation movie is going to kick them in the pants and make them go. Yeah, that's a little disturbing how much that seems to resemble reality. What are the benefits of movies and storytelling that we're not able to get from reading books or having Socratic discussions? When somebody, there's also like psychological studies of this where, where somebody's brain is actually sort of in a different mode when they're just experiencing a story. They're not being defensive. They're not feeling attacked. They're not feeling like they have to respond somehow. They're just sort of letting it all come in and then deciding what they think about it. Sometimes deciding what they think about it like a month later, <laughs> sometimes while it's happening. And when it's in a setting that's fictional, kind of fictional there's nothing about it that is specifically about them so they can just sort of watch and enjoy and then decide what to make of it and that's why i think there's so much power in in allegory and analogy and and which i you know i use them constantly to take people out of their own life enough to look at principles and then go back to their own life and apply the principles and then go oh yeah something Something's horribly wrong, but it's so much more comfortable to tell it in a form where they don't have to feel attacked or like they have to say anything. They can just sort of, you know, absorb it and decide what they think. 
why is there such a dichotomy between when people are utilitarians versus when they're objectively deontological? For example, they will say Jim Crow is inherently wrong. National Socialist Germany is inherently wrong. Slavery is inherently wrong. Nuking Hiroshima? Well, um, actually, there was uh, some good to that. Um, well, and it's uh, kind of okay that Zelensky is forcing all men ages 18 to 65 to fight in a war against their will because there's actually benefits on the other side of this. Why is it that the same person is completely objective with regard to historical events, but when it comes to modernity, where they have a few more ties, they are complete subjectivists? Because most people don't think from first principles as you know people into libertarianism have noticed about the rest of the world they usually they they have what they're in they have the stuff they were raised to believe they have their assumptions and then they sort of they do outcome based reasoning which is like well i'm going to manufacture some excuse to justify what i've always assumed about reality and i can't go rah 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 yeah the us military and then point to the fact that, yeah, they committed the worst terrorist act in the history of the world, the nuking of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So I'll, I'll have to sort of manufacture some excuse for that so I can feel better about it. And I think when people do that, part of them, uh, I mean, people are very unaware of their own thought processes most of the time, but part of them deep down inside knows that they're kind of fishing for excuses. And part of them, I think, feels bad about it. And I think what those of us into the actual principles need to do is find the part of them that already feels a little bit bad about it and gently bring that to the surface. Because a lot of people, and I remember doing this myself when I was a statist, they make excuses for the brand of authoritarianism they were taught to believe in. And they sort of try to fudge things to make it make sense and to make it okay and legitimate or at least necessary or something. And Inside them is all they need to know to realize that that's bogus. And, and that's why I, I did the thing called Candles in the Dark. And it's why I'm working on a huge project called The Mirror to basically bring out of a person the part of them that already recognize those arguments as bogus. So there's what I refer to as the real them, that if, you know, if it was up to them and they were in a real situation, they'd recognize this would be really bad. No, I wouldn't, wouldn't vaporize 100,000 people in the name of peace, but retroactively, because I've been taught all this stuff, I'll make excuses for it. But that's the challenge to me. Isn't we're not in a world full of evil people that I have to talk into being good. If we were in that, I would just run for the Hills. Like you're not going to, not going to talk sociopaths into being nice, but I do believe, and this is, you know, it sounds depressing, but this is good news. We are in a world of well-intentioned people trying to do the right thing who are accidentally cheering for evil on a regular basis because they've been taught to believe things that don't match what they instinctively understand about right and wrong. And that's the battle that, hasn't, that has to happen. It isn't me versus them. It's who they really are versus the authoritarian crap they've been taught to believe. And pretty much everything I do is focused on having them have to see the two sides of that and then pick one in their own brain. Not I'm going to bludgeon them until their beliefs match mine is I'm going to gently bludgeon them until their beliefs match themselves instead of crap they were taught. Certainly. Uh, when it comes to uh, things like the 1619 Project, uh, really brought uh, slavery to the forefront with the New York Times. And if you read uh, Hannah Nicole Jones and Matthew Desmond, they say uh, slavery is very bad for reasons such as slavery is free labor. There is severe mistreatment. There is severe inequality. You have controlled environments where you can and can't do things. Owners yield massive profits. And there is a double standard when it comes to the races of the people involved. Not a single word about initiating violence against peaceful people against their will. Do you think that be, because we focus so much on the skin color aspect of, of slavery that it's completely distracted us from the inherent principle, which is why people can't see that statism and conscription are slavery? Yeah, and that's the thing is the people in power are smart enough. I mean, the Jones Plantation is entirely about this. They're smart enough to not just say, we're going to rule you because we can do what we say or we kick you or shoot you or whatever. They have to play games. And when people get upset uh, after being mistreated and robbed and, and all that stuff, 
they need an outlet for their frustration and hatred and fear and anger. And the rulers need it to not be them because if all of their victims, white, black, purple, green, I don't freaking care if all of their victims get together and say, we recognize the people harming all of us. That's it for the rulers. So they have to, even when the past injustices were totally their doing, like this was government imposed people pretending to own other people they still have to say, well, this is a problem of that group of peasants versus this group of peasants. It's white versus black or rich versus poor or this versus that. Anything except the people trying to mind their own business and the people trying to violently dominate them. And so like you're pointing out in that debate, when you when they miss the fact that, well, how about like claiming you own people? I think that's kind of the problem, like initiating violence based on the claim that somebody else is your property. But in the respectable debates, they're always going to keep out of it the fundamental point that actually matters. So you can, you know, watch on TV all day long, people bickering about, you know, trivial surface details that don't matter. And all of them will accept as indisputable gospel that, of course, governments have the right to dominate and rob people and control people. Of course, all the peasants have an obligation to pay tribute to them and obey whatever they come up with. But you're allowed to bicker about which crook you want on the throne and which particular ways you want to be robbed and, and that stuff to, to keep the, the, you know, the window of discussion in a degree that's completely pointless. And the Jones plantation actually gets into that. Like we need them mad at each other. We need them bickering over something that doesn't matter and doesn't give them any power. And that's pretty much all of, well, I was going to say mainstream news. They're not even mainstream anymore because their their numbers have dwindled so much that now random podcasters have more than like CNN and stuff. But yeah, they have to they have to keep the principles that matter out of the discussion if they want to hold on to their power. And that's starting to falter and fall apart in a big way. But they're still going to try to say, well, yeah, white people, you should be scared of black people and black people, you should be mad at white people. And they're having some success, but I see a lot of people these days seeing through that and going, I don't think the problem is just people who look different than me. I think there's something else going on. And we made it a point in the Jones Plantation to make it really obvious the problem is not the color of people's skin. It's something way worse. One of the amazing things in the movie uh, that uh, you, you've spoken about is there is uh, one uh, per one of the slaves on the plantation who more or less gets wise to uh, the operation and what's going on and goes uh, n not only uh, tries to tell, he's actually invited to tell by the slave owner himself and says, sure, go tell him. And he's like, oh. You're going to let me and encourage me to tell him. He goes, all right, well, uh, the, the jig is up. I'm going to expose you guys. And to see their reaction when he brings them the truth was so incredible because it's something I've lived uh, in, my, uh, in my personal life. Why is it that people are so attached to certain things as opposed to be able, being able to observe them objectively? And why is it that truth tellers are so violently resisted? Well, I could <laughs> rant about that for three hours. So let's see if I can boil it down to something a little shorter than that. People, and this was true of outright slaves. Like recently I did some videos based on the, the writings of uh, Frederick Douglass, who grew up as a slave and he described his experience. Whatever people are accustomed to, they just kind of imagine, well, that's how things are. And to some extent, how things need to be or something, whatever. And if somebody comes along and says, this is fundamentally wrong, the problem is that you're telling them your entire view of reality and your experience and your life has to be thrown out the window and changed with, and, and replaced with something completely fundamentally different. And that's scary. And I would even use the example of slavery as a lot of slaves when they were freed had no idea what to do. Like they never had to think about that stuff. They were, you know, domesticated human livestock. And that's just profoundly stinking evil. But one of the evil things about it is that it trains them to not think as human beings and to not think as if they're in charge of their own lives. So when suddenly they're just thrown out, it's kind of like throwing out a child into the world. Like, ah, go take care of yourself. They've had no practice at that. 
they've been taught their whole lives, just do as you're told and everything will be fine. You don't have to think about things. Uh, there's even a line in the Jones plantation where they're like, wait a minute, what do you mean about this? Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. And that's there's basically so many what's, funny parts. It's what slave masters said, and it's what governments say. You don't need to know the details of what's going on. In fact, in fact, it's important for you to think that there's just magic stuff going on that you don't need to understand and couldn't possibly understand. And so when somebody comes along and, and tries to pull that rug out from under them and say, you know, big nanny state that makes everything work and takes care of everybody, it's actually inherently evil and should be done away with entirely, not just put a different clown into the circus. Most people are going to be uncomfortable because they because they're more scared of the unknown than they are of a familiar injustice. And it's I mean, this is the, the Declaration of Independence starts by basically saying in a different way, people put up with crap that they're accustomed to. <laughs> like and, you know, that that shows up everywhere. And it's totally true. And it's true even just philosophically. If you suggest to somebody a fundamentally different way that society could be, they're immediately scared because they don't know what it looks like. And they think, well, I know this. And it's, I mean, to, to throw in one more really sad analogy, most victims of domestic abuse stay with their abuser because they're scared of the unknown. It's like, but what would I do and where would I go and who would take care of me? Like, he's beating the hell out of you. You have to get out. Yeah, but I don't know what's out there. I know this. This is a known quantity. I get food, I get housing. Yeah, I get beat up. Well, that's why I, I often refer to, to, you know, the, the battered citizenry syndrome where they're scared literally of the idea of life without the biggest abuser on their planet, which is their own government. They're scared of the idea without that because it's unfamiliar. And so anyway, I'll stop there rather than going yeah. three hours. And, and that's such a good analogy, because whenever uh, I'm talking about this uh, Ukraine issue with someone and they and, and I ask them, well, what would happen if Putin just got all of Ukraine and all the bad potential things they list him doing? Zelensky and Poroshenko, the two previous presidents, have already done to Ukraine when I talk yeah. about. OK, so so, so first he's going to get Ukraine, then Poland, then Eastern Europe, then Western Europe, then South America, then Mexico, and then he's going to take over America. What it can you start listing some of the evil things that he's going to do once he's accomplished, you know, the greatest feat in uh, all of human civilization and all the things they list are things that Biden's done. Trump has done. Obama, Obama's done. <laughs> when it comes to uh, addressing people's fear of the unknown is maybe the best thing we can do. Use empirical examples of all the private uh, security that exists at banks, malls, stadiums. Um, your uh, all your online accounts have tons of private cybersecurity and software. Is that where empirical examples come in when people's fear of the unknown uh, arises? Yeah, I think there's. I, I also want to mention the the threat management center and what Dale Brown has done because that's just been amazing. Yeah. I don't do that good a job of keeping up with it, but their entire philosophy and approach is exactly what it would be in a free society where people go like, we're going to make a company whose job it is to protect people from nasty people. And they, I think a lot of people are only going to be able to learn by example. And like you said, there are some examples right now that you can point to that like here it's happening right now over there. That isn't government. That isn't authority. That's people figuring out how are we going to deal with this private charities, private protection, private, you know, a million different things. But still, government goes to such lengths to, to teach people that it would be chaos and mayhem without them that they still think there's some unknown magical things happening only because we have government and a constitutional republic and yada, yada, yada. And if you ask them, well, what do you think is going to happen if they go? Like you said, they usually describe what happened. Basically, their, their argument is, but if we didn't have government, we'd end up with government <laughs> it's literally what they there would be a gang that robs us all there is it's called government and the funny thing is the or the sad thing the only gang capable of robbing the american people for example is the gang already doing it because it's the only gang that these particular victims have been taught to imagine have the right to do it if china came in and said we're taking half of your income there would be this huge revolution and the invaders would be completely demolished because like 100 million Americans have guns. 
But when people who look like us and sound like us do it and say they're representatives serving the people and constitutionally serving their blah, 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 people go, oh, uh, oh, well, I guess that's how it is. But the fact that their their worst nightmare description, like you said, is a description of what's already happening to them is kind of a dead giveaway that they don't really know how to think in terms of principles. And they think that, well, we need to be robbed by this gang because otherwise a gang might rob us. And it, it really boils down to, to arguments that are that silly, but they don't see it again because they know the comfortable abuse, the predictable abuse. It's not even all that predictable anymore, but sometimes predictable abuse by the, the familiar abuser. And most people will choose that over an unfamiliar freedom, which is sad. And I mean, that it gets literally explained in, in Jones Plantation to the guy figuring it out why the rest of the people don't want the truth you have to tell them. They don't care. They don't want it to be true. They don't want to listen. It was amazing being present for a ransomware attack on an engineering firm in Arizona. The, all their assets were completely stolen and they didn't know what to do. So they called a private IT company who got a hold of Microsoft's um, uh, back end and the admin administration, Google Cloud files. They got uh, a hold of their PayPal accounts and PayPal private security. All these private security firms, another one's WebRoot and Sentinel One, they used. And I'm just sitting there and I go, I bet out of in this room full of status, none of them is going to say, "Quick, call 911." They're just going to be. <laughs> they're just going to go straight to private security. It's not even a discussion. Uh, hey, government, here's my IP address. Go get my stuff back. What's an IP address? Do you have any weed on you so I can put you in a cage? <laughs> it, 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 even they know it, it, it's slowly coming to an end. Even when I'm watching this Johnny Depp trial on Netflix and he's just on the stand. He's like, yeah, I used to use cocaine with that guy. And I'm thinking, hey, true status believers, go arrest him. He just admitted to committing a crime, but it's like, look, we don't really believe that. We say it because we pledge allegiance to the flag, but that's not really where our hearts are. So that is such a point of optimism for movies like uh, Jones Plantation. There, People are really ripe for a message like this because their heart is not in statism. Even the biggest, this was not a company of a bunch of anarcho-capitalists or anything. Probably had never even heard what the word is, but they all went to private security because it was much more efficient and consumer friendly. Um, the, in the uh, movie's description, you mentioned the difference between controlling via brute force versus owning a person. What is the difference between those two? Yeah, and that's a line in the movie that we we throw into the trailer too, where Mr. Smith is explaining like, yeah, you can control a man through brute force for a certain amount of time, but you cannot truly own a man unless he thinks that your word is law and that he is obligated to obey and virtuous for doing so. And that is the difference between physical enslavement and mental enslavement. If you can train somebody to think that they're actually beholden to you and that it's it's not just, oh, you have the ability to forcibly dominate me. It's you have the right to forcibly dominate me. And that is what the word authority means, which is why, you know, the focus of almost everything I do is bashing the concept of authority and the notion that other people by way of rituals and elections and stuff can have the moral right to dominate other people. And so Mr. Smith has to <laughs> explain to Mr. Jones the difference between, yeah, you can violently dominate somebody, but that's temporary and very unstable way to try to enslave somebody because the moment they have a chance to, to get away or to you know hang you or something, you their oppressor, they're probably going to. But if you can convince them that this is legitimate and righteous. And again, Frederick Douglass explains all this too and explains the process of figuring out this isn't okay that they treat us like property. Um, that difference is massive. And I, I really hope that a bunch of people, like a bunch of normal people who watch the movie, then, you know, go back into their daily lives and they see a political ad and they go, oh man, <laughs> this, this is the Jones plantation. Like it's, it's right in front of me. And it's like we did it blatantly enough that I think a lot of people are going to do that and recognize that this is just, I didn't I never left the movie. We're still there. That's why the tagline is actually we all live on Jones Plantation um, <laughs> in case it was too subtle before that.
Uh, part of your uh, thesis in general is the problem is the belief in authority. You uh, use the terms the problem is not in Washington, D.C. The problem is between the ears of 7 billion people. Um, if I look at uh, all the governments, I see that they have m almost uh, all the tanks, most of the guns and uh, tons of, you know, very big buildings with tons of laws and regulations. Uh, what does public opinion have to do with the power that people with all the guns have? Well, the thing I've said before is I don't care how many guns they have. I care how many trigger fingers they have, because those guns don't do anything unless they have a bunch of people who are able and willing to point them at us and tell us to obey the ruling class or else. And that is, again, the mental side of things. So it's I think it's very easy, including for pro-freedom people, to look at the big, bad, scary, terrifying government and all their power and sort of imagine it as this big, you know, Sauron and Mordor and miss the fact that all of that hinges on the lie of authority. If their enforcers didn't imagine that what they were doing is right and justified and law enforcement for law and order and yada, 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 they wouldn't have any trigger fingers. And you can have a scared politician in a room with a pile of guns. You know, he's not going to use them. They're all freaking cowards. They're not going to do anything if we, the people, aren't volunteering to victimize and abuse each other in the name of these lying psychos. So yeah, the problem is the belief system. It isn't that the psycho thinks he has the right to rule. It's that his victims think he has the right to rule. Because if one guy thinks he has the right to rule and nobody else believes him, then he's like in an insane asylum somewhere. It's like, oh yeah, that psycho thinks he's king or something. I don't know. He's just kind of bonkers, but nobody cares. Like what's for lunch? But it, 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 Absolutely. And that isn't to say they're not evil and conniving and scheming sociopaths, but there's nothing to work with. There's no power if nobody obeys them and nobody obeys them if nobody's enforcing it and nobody's enforcing it. If the people who would have been enforcers say, I'm not going to be a thug of that lunatic. Like that's, that's not okay. It's immoral. It's also dangerous because eventually my victims are going to say, stop that, or we're going to use the same force on you. So it's and that was really encouraging when when I figured that out, that it isn't this big, massive, powerful enemy. It's a bunch of weaselly, slimy little just <laughs> pieces of nothing. And then a whole bunch of people they tricked into doing their bidding. It's the idea. It's the belief. And when that's gone, you don't need a big revolution. You don't need to overthrow. You don't need to do anything. Then it's just some babbling psycho in a corner saying he's king and people just sort of walk by and look the other way. Nobody cares because <laughs> nobody believes him. So and that's did yeah, you, that's the focus of everything I do pretty much. Did you see the new Mitch McConnell video where he stops mid sentence and just where he freezes. stalls or he reboots? <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> mid sentence, just <laughs> flat line. Uh, All right. USHistory.org explains uh, some of the arguments for slavery at the time uh, in the American South and uh, also goes into uh, historical examples. Let's see if any of these uh, sound familiar. First of all, the experts say slavery is legitimate. This is a paper from Dr. James Hunt, The Negro's Place in Nature. Also saying, defenders of slavery argued that the sudden end to the slave economy would have a profound and killing economic impact in the South, where reliance on slave labor was the foundation of their economy. The cotton economy would collapse. The tobacco crop would dry in the fields. Rice would cease to be profitable. Defenders of slavery argued that if all the slaves were freed, there would be widespread unemployment and chaos. This would lead to uprisings, bloodshed, and Anarchy. Defenders of slavery argued that by comparison with the poor of Europe and the workers in the northern states, the slaves were better cared for. Larkin, what can we learn from the arguments for slavery in the 1800s? Uh, that's literally just every campaign <laughs> commercial <laughs> you'll see. We can't let people just voluntarily handle this because people will starve and die and be murdering each other and killing each other and eating each other in the streets and stuff. It's it's the same ridiculous approach, and it's sad how often it works, of basically a group of human beings, in fact, the worst human beings in the world, pretty much, um, 
the funny thing is even most statists accept that politicians <laughs> are pretty much the worst people in the world, the but still <laughs> think we have to bow to them. So the worst people in the world are telling the rest of us, hey, if we don't dominate you, you stupid, violent, nasty, idiotic, you know, horrible, immoral animals would be like killing and eating each other and stuff. And that's like basically a summary of what you described and what they were saying about slavery is there will be violence and mayhem and you'll never figure out the, and you know, now it's a running joke in, in libertarian circles, the who will pick the cotton, but they were arguing that like oh, the, yeah. the, the thing of when you say, let's not have a ruling class, but my roads, who's going to build a road if we don't have, politicians who don't build the roads and bureaucrats who don't build the roads and tax collectors who don't build the roads, stealing our money, wasting most of it, and then giving a little bit of it to our neighbor who builds the roads, who we could have just paid to build a road ourselves. But the whole mentality of the just like they're talking down to children and saying, well, you children don't know how to exist without your masters looking out for you. And it's it's gross to read Frederick Douglass's uh, accounts of masters talking exactly that way to them. And I covered that in one of my recent videos, just saying, yeah, you, it, it's only going to cause trouble if you like think about stuff or learn how to read or think of the future at all. That was a big one. Like, don't think of the future. That's just going to like make you uppity and cause problems. We'll take care of you. And the masters aren't just talking like because you'll be trouble for me. They're talk talking like it'll be better for you if you don't think of the future or learn how to read or question anything. And that's that's the foundation of what you read. It's the foundation of literally every political campaign from every candidate, because it's always saying, well, we need this government program to do something because you stupid mortals can't possibly come up with like a peaceful, voluntary way to help the poor or build a road or protect each other or whatever you need us, your betters, to forcibly impose it on all of you. And I think one of the most powerful things of using the allegory of slavery is we all look back now and say, that's just horrendously evil. That's about as bad as you can get is pretending somebody else is your property. But the parallels in the propaganda and what they did are really dang close. Now, for those like waiting to be offended, I'm not saying that my life anywhere near compares to the level of suffering and injustice of an actual chattel slave. I'm saying the mentality of the abusers and dominators and thieves is the same. They just figured out, well, now these, you know, now our victims have guns, which is problematic. So we have to play the game differently, but we're still going to talk to them as if they're children who couldn't, you know, change a light bulb without government telling them how and they, they're not going to help their neighbors unless we're here. So they pass laws to like prohibit you from helping your neighbor. And then they steal your money and then they help your neighbor and say, see, without us, yada, yada, yada. But I think a lot of people, it's gotten so blatant and ridiculous. And that's, you know, when you have just outright bailouts of we're just going to give billions of dollars to these giant corporations and huge banks, even normal people are going, wait a minute, what happened to the rhetoric about you're there to serve? Now you're just directly robbing us. In plain view, it's not even like hidden corruption that somebody found out about. You're just doing it out in the open, robbing all of us and then giving gazillion dollars to this bank. And that. so I think even normal people are getting to the point where they're tired of being talked down to as children. And they're sort of being forced to grow up by their abusive parents who keep being <laughs> pieces of crap. And finally, the children are like, we don't like any of you anymore. Like mommy and daddy, mommy Democrat and daddy Republican. Like you're both just scumbag. You just abuse us and rob us. We don't actually need you. And so I think ironically now the general public is more open to these ideas than they've ever been in my lifetime, like by a long shot, which is fun, fun to see. Like it's horrible to see the suffering that a lot of people had to go through because it's gotten so bad, even a lot of normal people are being pushed into questioning things and looking at government saying, no, we don't need you. You aren't like the wise, nice, loving people making it so the rest of us can get along. We get along pretty well until you bastards come along and, and threaten everybody and rob everybody and screw the economy. And so people are learning. And it's amazing because they'll simultaneously say, 
it's important for you to be empowered. And that's why every four years you get a vote between two of us. And this is your right. A lot, not every other country has this. This is so vitally important that you be empowered. I'm like, can I opt out of funding this school? And they're like, no, we'll put you in a cage if you if you try and do that. I go, two seconds ago, I needed to be empowered once every four years. Now I can't choose where to send a third of my income. Uh, so the way the way they address this is, uh, OK, you've gotten me. It's technically, philosophically wrong for one person to own another, but it's an emergency. Let me uh, share some emergencies I've lived with. Climate, racism, greed, rich people, Muslims, Mexicans, Russians, sexism, guns, Iran, North Korea, ignorance and acid rain. That is what I came up with two minutes before we started recording as far as uh, emergencies in my lifetime, because uh, ideally freedom is good. But insert emergency. How do we get? Oh, I'm, I, I forgot. Uh, colds exist that have a survival rate of ninety nine point nine percent. I forgot. That's another reason that they get to violently dominate us. How do you get people to see through the next scam? How do you train them so when the next one comes along, as it inevitably will, uh, wh what are some tips you have so people can see through the propaganda in the future? There, there's two different approaches, and a whole lot of people do one that I don't do, which is try to factually educate people. Now, weirdly, the ruling class itself and their lapdog propagandists, I won't even call them news or reporters because they're obviously not. They're literally just propagandists. Ironically, they've done a marvelous job of showing people that they've been lying their butts off for three years straight about everything, like every single thing that us crazy conspiracy theorists said, they've admitted one by one, all of it, every single thing we said to begin to begin with, which like videos got banned. I got a couple of mine taken off YouTube for saying things that now the mainstream media is completely admitting about like lockdowns and the damage those do and, and just a zillion things. So there's the factual side of people realizing, Oh, that was nowhere near the threat they pretended it was, you know, it, it just came out that, yeah, the whole list of COVID deaths, um, are like <laughs> almost all of them weren't actually from that. They're saying that now. And some of us that were saying that to begin with, because we understand like how numbers work a little bit, um, you know, got condemned and banned and stuff. I actually don't focus on that approach. And the reason is it sort of accepts the premise that, well, if it really was an emergency, then it would be OK to violently dominate them and imprison an entire country and violently control everybody everywhere but it wasn't really serious enough to justify that ew that's not where the discussion should be the discussion should be in principle you don't get to do that now if you're so scared you want to say i can't come to your property okay i won't don't worry if you're that scared of it i don't really want to be on your property anyway but the that's why my approach is always to the principle of the thing and the thing is most people are really bad at thinking in terms of principles, but I find that one way, and I do this in Candles in the Dark, and I, the, the mirror will do it heavily too. If you put them on the losing end of a principle, they're usually really good at recognizing the principle involved. Like if I think you should have to exercise this much and eat this much for your own health, and so I have a department of health with a SWAT team that's going to kick down your door every few days and make sure you only have the right things in your refrigerator and, and you're doing enough exercise. Are you okay with that? And everybody will say, no, you don't have the right to do that to me. Okay. As it happens, I agree. But it, what if it really would help your health? Like, because it would, like if I forcibly limited how much bad food you could eat and I made you exercise physically, that would help your health. I mean, being, <laughs> being stressed out by being oppressed is kind of a negative. But most people, if on, they're on the losing end, recognize the principle of, I know, and that might help my health, but you don't have the right to do that because I'm in charge of me. Suddenly, they understand self-ownership and non-aggression, even if they don't know those terms and don't even think very clearly, clearly enough to call it a principle. So I start with it with them as victim and then see if I can get them to express the principle of, yeah, nobody has the right to, to force me to do something for my own good. And then I'll say, okay, cool. I agree, which is why I'm not that tyrant. Now, 
do they have the right to force me to do something? What if there's something you think I should do? And for whatever reason, I don't think that would actually benefit my health. And once their brain is in the setting of thinking of the principle with them on the losing end, with them as victim, suddenly almost everybody comes up, becomes open to the idea of, oh, yeah, I guess it would be a little bogus for me to say you can't force it on me, but I can force it on you. And then they usually do the thing of look at the ceiling inside because their brain is trying to sort stuff out. It's one of the things we point out in Candles in the Dark. At some point, expect them to go when they don't know what to do about, you know, the, the contradictions in their brain. But yeah, usually putting them on the losing end in some scenario and conveniently in the last few years, millions of like decent law abiding taxpayers were put on the losing end of authoritarian idiocy and learn the hard way why there are those principles. Like, yeah, they called it for the common good and shut you down and they were all hypocrites and they were all out partying and this didn't do any good and they made exceptions which demonstrated that they didn't believe it either. And so a bunch of normal people are like, hey, this violates my rights, okay? Now that you recognize it's not okay to do it to you, maybe you should think about whether it's okay for you to vote to have them do it to other people. So it's it's a little weird how many people have been forced into finally starting to think about principles by the authoritarians. So, but oh well, at least something got them there. The <laughs> website is jonesplantationfilm.com. Find the link for the movie in the description. So is the lesson from slavery that existed as, almost as far back on every continent uh, since uh, humanity has been around, is the lesson that people when given arbitrary power over others, will become uh, corrupted themselves and they will become the very exploiters that they fear and everyone else? Yeah, there, there's basically two kinds. One is they were already a psycho, which is why they wanted that position of power. Or they were, you know, basically decent people and turned into psychos. And I actually included from Frederick Douglass a a really sad description um, and shows his level of awareness where he describes the wife of one of his masters who was just so sweet and kind and would just like talk to him like an equal to begin with and was starting to teach him to learn how to read until the husband said, you can't do that. Like a slave's not going to be any good if he like expects to be treated that way and learns how to read and learns how to think. And Frederick Douglass describes that she just turned into this horrible monster. And he recognized from the position of a slave being owned, he recognized slavery harmed her as much as it harmed me. And just, wow, that level of awareness of human psychology. And it's true. And that's why my book, The Most Dangerous Superstition, gets into how even the people wielding authority, the belief is destroying them, too. And it doesn't that doesn't make it OK what they do to other people. But agents of authority are also victims of authority. They're victims of the same lie. It destroys their souls. You know, the reason such a high percentage of cops are involved in domestic violence is not because they're peaceful and happy with their power. It's because it turns people into monsters. And, you know, the, the movie mentions that a little bit. And uh, there are, I mean, there's there's so many things we could have gone into in the movie that <laughs> it sort of got whittled down. Speaking of which, I should mention the fact that there's a, um, a novel that I wrote basically at the same time of the Jones Plantation. Um, it's in pre-printing now. It's thejonesplantation.com. Um, there's no the in the movie. There is in the novel. <laughs> Somebody might notice that at some point. Um, which gives way more time to get into the discussions and the and the thoughts in people's heads and stuff because uh, um, like the movie is, a, is just what I wanted the movie to be. And then the novel can do things a movie can't just like a movie can do things a novel can't, but that gets way more into the psychology and the mentality. And Mr. Smith describes, yeah, if you give somebody power over another, you'll see his darker side come out. And that's mentioned briefly in the movie, but the novel covers that way more um, because it's, it's true that it, as soon as somebody thinks they have the right, to forcibly dominate somebody else, their, their soul, if you want to call it that, their morality, their conscience is doomed. They will turn into monsters. And, and I know someone who's the nicest guy in the world and a friend of mine today who used to be a cop and he used the word monster to, to describe what it turned him into. And he was one who was aware enough that he recognized and he remembers one particular little incident 
and realized I'm the bad guy. I'm the bastard here. I'm the problem. And, and so he got out of that, out of the status mindset, but he could see the harm that not being on the receiving end of power, but holding the power does to human beings. And so that's, you know, one of many things that I hope people think about, uh, you know, as long as they're playing the silly game of like, which puppet should we put on the throne next time? It's like the worst thing you could do to a good person is put them on that throne. Because if they accept the job, they will not be a good person. But if they don't get assassinated, <laughs> they're going to be a horrible person sooner or later. There is no other option. And if you put an evil person on the throne, well, we're all going to suffer for it. Either way, we're all going to suffer. There isn't a way to use the ring of power to make good things happen. And I hope more people start to notice that. Yeah, you can't help but uh, watching this uh, excellent movie where you go, OK, so if I were just a citizen at the time, would I have really been opposed to slavery? Would I have bought into all this uh, propaganda? Well, what if I was a slave? And then you say, well, what if I had been born into a slave family and I just inherited the slaves? I can already hear myself rationalizing. Well, if I just let them go, then they'll be picked up by someone else who's even worse than me. So really, I'm kind of doing them a favor along with myself, and I can use the power I get from their enslavement to, uh, you know, further other abolitionist movements in the future. And just the, the mind's ability to rationalize the most ridiculous things is unbelievable. So uh, one example that I came up with with uh, modern day uh, psychopaths that uh, we deal with was uh, Barack Obama's science advisor, John P. Holdren, co-wrote a book with Paul Ehrlich, author of The Pop Population Bomb. 10-time appearance on uh, Johnny Carson. Uh, the book says, To date, there has been no serious attempt in Western countries to use laws to control excessive population growth. Although there exists ample authority under which population growth could be regulated, for example, under the United States Constitution, effective population control measures could be enacted under the clauses that empower Congress to appropriate funds to provide for the general welfare and to regulate commerce or under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. There's an entire section like this. So the point is, what do you say to the mindset that says there's no evil people, there's just people who see uh, different solutions to different problems that have different costs and benefits? Because Holdren is trying to save the world from extinction by forced sterilization and forced uh, population control abortions. What do you say to uh, the mindset that evil doesn't exist, there's uh, only people who haven't uh, really heard the truth? Yeah, and to them, it doesn't, like if somebody's that out of touch and delusional that they don't think there are sociopaths, like sometimes I might try to talk them into it, but sometimes I would just focus on the fact that it doesn't matter if they started as sociopaths. If they believe they have the right to do whatever they want, they're going to be evil. And I even made a, a silly little animated video um, years ago called If You Were King that points out that if you, the viewer, you know, assuming you're a decent person with good intentions, if you were put on the throne and now you're the king of all these people and you wanted to do good with that power, you can't. It's not an option. Your good intentions don't matter because all your power is, is the ability to use coercion and violence on people. And there isn't a way to improve society by initiating violence against <laughs> lots of people. And I think a lot of people have to be brought to it to, from the principal side, because so many people, pretty much everybody who votes, um, they imagine, e even if they, they don't think clearly enough to, to say this out loud, the whole ends justifies the means thing of like, well, this is a serious problem. Like uh, gun violence is so scary that we have to send like armed thugs into people's houses to steal their guns. Never mind that that is gun violence. <laughs> we're just we're going to skip over that part. But it's okay to initiate violence against this huge category of people because of the overall positive blah, 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 blah. And again, if, if you can put somebody in the position where they're on the losing end of that whole common good ends justify the means things, suddenly they recognize the principle. Like I say, well, let's say, you know, your neighbors get together and they say, you know, we would all be better off if we killed that guy and divvied up his stuff. And you're that guy. Are you okay with that? Because it would serve the common good. They're all going to benefit when they divvy up your stuff after they like dump you in a ditch somewhere. 
yeah, it doesn't work for you, but I mean, you're just one individual. Aren't you happy to, you know, follow democracy, follow what the majority says for the common good? Because don't the ends justify the means? All your neighbors are going to be a little bit richer and there'll be a little bit more open space because you're dead. So you're not there anymore. Are you okay with that? Nobody's okay with that. Everybody goes, no, that would be horrible. Okay. Why? I agree it's horrible, but why is it horrible? And to try to get them to voice the, the principle themselves when they're on the losing end has been very helpful for a lot of people because suddenly they see, oh, and if I turn that around, it stops being okay for me to vote for somebody else to rob you for the common good and control you for the common good and regulate this for the common good and violently dominate all sorts of people. Um, and it, it makes people start to sort of recognize the, the principle of, you know, there's no such thing as I get to be free, but you don't. But if you don't have a society of freedom, you don't have freedom. You have a tyrant and a bunch of victims. And unless somebody's going for, you know, a sociopath and his goal is, well, I get to be the tyrant who can do what I want. And you're all my victims. Then people have to recognize if I don't apply the same. I mean. How long have people been saying things like, like every religion has their own version of do unto others as you would have done unto you or the better version, don't do unto others as you don't want them to do unto you. The, those ideas have been around forever. And if people just applied that to politics, they'd go, why am I voting? Why, why am I supporting any of this? I don't want them doing that to me. But it's, it's something that they're trained not to think about. And so it's up to us to find ways to make them think about it, like the Jones Foundation. And I always thought it was strange how they would call us hyper-individualists when our philosophy necessarily requires con mutual consent uh, from all parties involved. I don't get a penny out of other people's pocket or a second of their time unless I'm able to create value in exchange for them. But Viktor Orban, the, the Hungarian prime minister, said there's two ways to view the world. There's just yourself and your ego, and then there's the collective. I go, it's not very caring about the collective. I want money for this project, and I'll put everyone in a cage who doesn't chip in. I go, that is more hyper-individualistic than anything I've ever heard any libertarian say, <laughs> except the people from the Ayn Rand Institute who do justify Dresden and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. <laughs> the website is jonesplantationfilm.com. Um, when it comes to uh, lessons you've learned from other novels, th the reason I wanted to have you on is uh, I was uh, taken to the uh, to see the Richard Jewell movie, the guy who's uh, the FBI pins uh, this bombing on. And I remember thinking, I already hate the FBI. Why do I need to see an anecdote <laughs> about why I should hate them more? This is just going to give me an ulcer. This is going to do nothing. But to actually see the movie. And to see this guy's emotions and to see the cruelty and to see them inconvenience him really makes the it really brings to life that there's the philosophical non-aggression principle. And, you know, the, what they did was immoral. But then there's the genuine suffering that can only be brought to life on the screen. And I think uh, Jones Plantation does uh, an excellent job of this. Um, give me some lessons you've learned from other works of fiction. What is uh, the great lesson you learned from uh, Atlas Shrugged? Ayn Rand, for all her inability to give up that last little vestige of statism, did such a marvelous job countering the collectivist BS that's designed to justify the enslavement of mankind under the guise of, we're all in this together, and we're going to work together, and things are going to be equal and fair, and we're going to be caring, and, and blah, 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 and pointing out how ridiculous the collectivist notion is because it's it's literally saying well the individual doesn't matter and despite the fact that the collective is made up entirely of individuals the way to serve the collective is to abuse and enslave every single member of the collective except for this tiny little ruling class and being able to see through that and go that's you know that is as anti the common good as you can get, you're just using rhetoric, spinning it around and using it as an excuse to basically punish creativity and productivity and reward laziness and stupidity and violence and looting and, and all that fun stuff. Um, and again, it's just, it's mushy headed thinking. And Ayn Rand does an awesome job of, of daring to just, you know, bash down all the, the stupid euphemisms 
that have been used to try to pretend that violently dominating every single individual is somehow good for the individuals as a collective. Like, no, you know, for the sake of this chicken coop, we're going to chop every one of your heads off because each one of you are a threat to the collective. We, we are, I mean, even the movie ants, like we are the colony. <laughs> this is for the good of the colony. And they're being like March shot. Was that a bug's life or ants? I forget. They came out at the same time with the same plot. But, there, but he actually says, what are you talking about? We are the colony. And that's, you know, we need more people to realize when violence is justified against the individual based on, well, it's for the common good or the collective, which, by the way, the right and the left do. People have to recognize that's never for the collective. There is no conflict between the group and the individual unless you're using one of them as an excuse to initiate violence against individuals. And that's, you know, that that's a line of BS that the, the, the commies and collectivists have been using forever. That somehow you only care about yourself if you don't want to be violently abused and dominated and don't want the person next to you violently abused and dominated either. Like, how is that selfish? <laughs> so, yeah, it's important that, you know, all of what they do is by way of propaganda, because like I said, you can't. Most people are trying to do what they think is the right thing. You can't just say, hey, everybody, you want to cheer for evil? Because people go, no. Okay, do you want to cheer for equality and fairness and caring for the less fortunate? Okay. And I'll be like, okay, yeah, only what do you mean by that? <laughs> because every time I hear that, what people mean when they say that is the violent extortion and domination of all of the individuals in the name of a non-existent collective because it's actually just the ruling class and getting people to see through the tricks. And that that's what Jones plantation is all about is I want people to watch the movie and wonder how much of it they would have fallen for, because the truth is most people would have fallen for Mr. Smith stuff in the game. They would have believed the game. They would have played along with the game and they would have gotten mad at anybody who said, uh, I think something's wrong here. And that's why this, the movie has a, Rather different feel to it than the average movie. Rather different conclusion. Lots of things about it are rather different than the average movie. And uh, it's not just fiction stories as well. You can uh, th watch the Eric Garner murder, and it's like the most brutal, evil thing you've ever seen. The guy's begging for his life. But somehow it like it, that hurts you more than just thinking... All right, 22,000 uh, people uh, in Dresden were killed in like uh, two days by the Royal Air Force. That yeah. one death, because there's a story behind it, because you're actually seeing it with your eyes, makes it so much more real. Um, yeah. I thought this movie did a uh, terrific job of that as well. Uh, one other story that uh, you have mentioned uh, to me previously. Uh, the moon is a harsh mistress. What is uh, the great lesson you learned from this book? Well, a bunch of Heinlein stuff. I, it was forever ago that I read that one. Um, but showing again, using, using fiction to show how it applies to actual human beings and the actual psychology involved. And like, cause people like to think in the, the, the superficial, stupid Hollywood version of, well, there's evil villains who come in and they're evil villains doing evil villainy thing. And then there's a the good people going, this is horrible. We have to rise up and that's not how anything ever works. It's not how actual evil comes into, into power. And if you start to see, and you can see this in a bunch of different stories, but if you start to see how evil does what it does and how the human soul can be corrupted, whether it's intentionally or accidentally, then the fictional stories, even though they're fictional, like, like you said about the Eric Garner thing or, you know, Kelly Thomas, or, you know, unfortunately there's, rather long list of horribly brutal murders that agents of the state have committed. Waco comes to mind. If you can even do a fictional story where the person has to relate to people and go, what would I do? Or at least I could imagine that happening to a normal person, like the normal person as victim and the normal person as perpetrator and figuring out the normal people who fall for this stuff and do this stuff. And then who get victimized by it because they don't think clearly and they fall for tricks and stuff. That's to me, that's the power of fiction is to be able to tell a story and have people like unwitting, like automatically and accidentally relating that to real life. 
and learning something about humanity from something that never actually happened, but they could, they see the reality of human behavior and cause and effect and psychology in a fictional story and real can see a problem and can see what can happen even in a story that didn't like the Jones plantation. Like people can see that and go, yeah, I could see that person responding that way. And I can see that person responding this way. I can see Mr. Jones making excuses for being the beneficiary of this evil thing. I could see the guy who kind of stands up, but doesn't really want to put his neck out. And I could see the guy who does this and the people who don't believe him. And it's just, it's weird that people can learn so much about humanity and themselves by something that didn't happen. If a, if a story is told well, a fictional story can be almost as powerful as a true story at having people realize the, the reality of themselves and how their own brain works, as well as, you know, the brains of everybody around them. So uh, one thing that uh, I want to end on, when we look at... Uh, what, what, I definitely agree with you when you say um, that evil uh, is going to come in small mustache screaming in German and that's how we'll know that they're evil. Of course, that's a, there's a selection process like it, 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 like one percent of people are Scientologists and 100 percent of people at the Church of Scientology are Scientologists because the only people who go there are the Scientologists. The only people who make it into politics are those great manipulators. That's why there's so many of them there. It's a, uh, you, you know, uh, gosh, I forget what they call it. I think it's uh, an emergent property is what it's uh, right. referred to as. So how can we tell the difference between someone who's evil versus someone who really is just ignorant? Because most of our ancestors would have accepted war and slavery. Um, but, uh, you know, well, so uh, as far as differentiating between these two, some things I've tried to come up with, their willingness to consider alternatives and consider they're wrong, the amount of power they have to influence, so whether they are a slave owner of a thousand slaves or someone who's just heard about slavery and says, yeah, it's probably uh, best for everyone. And then the third thing that came to mind was their ability to empathize with foreseeable downsides of the things that they are advocating. What are some other metrics we can use to differentiate between people who are just ignorant, not yet there, and we got to push them a little versus evil psychos who we just need to defend ourselves against? I think to me, the dead giveaway is completely ignore all of their words and look at the literal reality of their actions. And this is something I, I use in candles in the dark for people like whether they're voting or advocating some policy is, OK, set aside the euphemisms and the vague garbage about I want to help the poor. OK, that's nice. I kind of want to help the poor, too. What is the literal reality of what you want to have happen? Well, give free money to poor people. Whose money? Do you have enough money to give it away yourself? Well, public funds. Okay. What does that mean? Where did it come from? And when they get to the part of it that's violently dominate and rob everybody, <laughs> the fact that they flounder around is yeah. because they've never looked there either. And so if you ask somebody, if you're like looking at a politician and, and, you know, talking to somebody like, do you think he's a good person? Never mind the rhetoric and the fluff and the way they, they mischaracterize and, you know, try to <laughs> gloss everything over and, and confuse everything. What is the literal reality of what will happen to somebody who doesn't go along with their agenda? Like if somebody's like, I'm for reasonable gun control to blah, blah, blah. Okay. Some little old lady doesn't want to give up her gun. What is literally going to happen to her? Don't give me the fluff about statistics over here. In that case, what do you want to have happen to that little old lady? And when you break it down to the literal reality, you can't hide the violence anymore. And suddenly this politician who's all about getting along and caring and taking care of people. Wow, he says lots of fluff. Does he give away his own money? No. Does he spend his own time caring for people? No. So what is the mechanism by which he does all of that lovely, fluffy stuff? Violence. Every single time, violence. Violence against real people whose lives are destroyed if they disobey. And just getting people to see through the mush, even if you do it by way of questions so that they have to describe, well, what's this universal basic income or free housing or gun control, whatever garbage they're, whatever authoritarian stuff they're cheering for, to just try to get them to see the literal reality. So, so in Candles in the Dark, we talk about always keeping the questions literal, personal, and specific. Not fluffy fluff that doesn't mean anything. 
What do you want to have happen to me specifically, precisely, and literally if I don't go along with whatever legal or legislative agenda you're in favor of? And just to get them to look there suddenly makes them recognize a bunch of things and make it, makes them recognize um, when they get to that point that some of the people cheering for that and getting elected into office for that, they don't mean well. They're not trying to help you. They're not giving away anything of their own. They're not limiting their own behaviors and what they can do at all. They're just hiding the love to dominate and control other people under lots of euphemisms. They're just using different words to describe slavery and hoping you won't notice, which is a big punch in the face at the end of <laughs> slave plantations. They've only changed the words they've used. Nothing else has changed. And that's even in, that exact line is in the original animated version. So that's what I loved about Carla's uh, question at Porkfest to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. She goes, "All right, uh, if we choose to secede, would you, as president, use violence against us?" I loved it because it was so specific. It's not like, "What do you think about nuclear power?" It's like, that, that, that's <laughs> right. so hard to pin him down. That's why I loved her question. Mm -hmm. Do you have time for one more question? Sure. Uh, the great. Uh, person who has uh, done probably uh, the most for uh, sh sharing the message of freedom in our generation, at least, is Ron Paul. What are some of the lessons we can learn from Ron Paul and hope to uh, emulate uh, those characteristics? I think, uh, <laughs> I think it's a little ironic. I think the most important, like he has started a lot of people on the journey that ended up at voluntarism. I think one of the most important things that he taught by example, but not on purpose, was that the political realm is not the way to accomplish anything. That's not where freedom comes from. And I was so happy to hear his closing comments on the House floor the last time he spoke in that den of vipers. The last thing he said about himself was what I had been saying about him for ages, which is I love the fact that he's talking about these ideas and it's just a miracle to me that he lived in that cesspool that long and still kept saying the same ideas. Like, I don't know anybody else who's done that. But basically what he said about himself is, I didn't accomplish anything. Like, I voted no against, like, almost everything that came up. Most of them passed anyway. Like, I never actually made a difference. And this is not the place. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but I encourage people to look it up. But this isn't what matters. What matters is what people believe. If people believe in freedom and want it, they'll get it. You're not going to get it from politics and from voting and stuff. And so I was so uh, I was so happy to hear him say that. But I think he accidentally demonstrated, especially because he ran for president and then both parties were just pound mm -hmm. him down, shut him up. Like, wait a minute. He's in one of your parties. What happened to demonstrate that the machine doesn't care what we want? It's not like trying to represent us, but sometimes does a bad job. And. I won't give any specifics, but there is absolutely a part in the Jones plantation that I hope people looking for a political solution notice along the way. You might not even know what I'm talking about and go, oh, man. But I think Ron Paul demonstrated there is no political solution and there never will be. When you have somebody actually principled saying what he thinks, the likelihood of him ever being given the power to do anything is zero. And if all else fails, they'll just shoot him. But they don't even need to because there's so many other ways to stomp them down and shut them up and corrupt people. Um, well, everybody but Ron Paul seems pretty easy to corrupt. He just kept being his stubborn self. And that's a compliment in this context. But I think a, a lot of people learned, oh, the, you know, begging the system and playing their game. That's not how you get to freedom. And hope some people learn that by watching the Jones Plantation, too. The website is jonesplantationfilm.com. Check it out. Uh, you're able to uh, watch the movie there. Thanks to everyone for watching. Keith and I don't tread on anyone and the Libertarian Institute. Larkin Rose, thank you for your time. Thanks for having me again.